So in a game as big and diverse as Warhammer 2, there are of course many, many different types of units. We have lizards, we have rats, we have three different kinds of elves, we have two different kinds of humans, we've got dwarves, we've got green skins, and we have many, many more. There are bound to be some units that you would consider strange or weird. Now this video isn't just going to go into, you know, the units that are strange if they appeared in our world, it's going to go into what the units that are weird within those factions. So what doesn't fit in with the green skins or the elves or the whatever, this is going to go through the weirdest units for every single faction in the game. So I'm going to lay out some ground rules here just so you know what sort of criteria we were judging by when we're working this out. Now, as you all know, I don't really know anything about the law, so I'm not judging on the law. You know, all the units in the game, as far as I'm aware, are fairly within the law and go with the correct faction. So nothing is too out of place law wise, at least to my knowledge. But as I said, don't know anything, so I'm not going to judge you on that. Now, also, weird does not mean bad. Weird does not also mean far too good. Weird just means weird. So as you'll see in this list, we have units that are bad. We have units that are good. Weirdness has nothing to do with how effective the unit is. Oh, my camera died. Yes, these are units that when you look at them next to the rest of their roster, you just think they don't really fit in. Now, this can either be from a visual standpoint or from a mechanical standpoint. Say, if a unit doesn't look like any of the other units or if it just doesn't do anything that's really necessary within the army. Also, this video was made possible with the help of the wonderful Colonel Damned's Discord, which I'm considering renaming the Damned after some discussion on stream, because that sounds like a pretty badass name if you ask me. Anyway, this video was made with the help of those guys, so if you want to join in on discussions like this, I'm going to be trying to hold them a little more regularly, and be sure to click the link in the description to join in that. Also, when you're there, be sure to check out the Select Your Role channel, in that you can react to the message that the bot has put in there to pick a faction to represent within the service. So in there, we have every single faction that we know are confirmed within the trilogy so far, so that goes from the Empire in Warhammer 1, all the way to Kislev and Cafe in Warhammer 3, and of course, I'll be adding any new ones that we get confirmed in the coming months. Now, this isn't just for fun, I'm planning to hold some tournaments fairly soon in the future, Hopefully, fingers crossed, that we'll be using these very teams, so be sure to join on so that you're in with a chance of participating and then obviously winning some cool prizes. All right, so all that being said, let's get going with our first faction, which is, of course, the High Elves. Now, this one was quite difficult because uh, the High Elves, I don't know if you've noticed, are kind of the, the most basic faction in Warhammer 2. You know, they're not dangerous in any way. They're not really very varied or unique in any way. They're just kind of the, the basic units that are in Warhammer 2. But that being said, when we came down to it, the Eagle Claw Bolt Thrower it just stuck out to us because when you think of the high elves you think of their strong front line of spears and then being backed up by superior archers their whole gimmick is martial prowess which means fantastic training and it doesn't take a great amount of training to use an artillery cannon you just kind of point in it does all the rest you know you really think of martial prowess and martial prowess meaning people that are skilled with using the weapons in their hands so master archers that can hit their targets from a million miles away spearmen that can hold their own in battle for hours at a time. The Eagle Claw Bolt Throw just doesn't really make sense. It seems more of a technological advancement than it does a martial one. And yes, I know it's basically a big ass bow that fires these bolts across the entire map. So it is technically, you know, still using a bow, but it, ju it just doesn't feel right to us. As I said, very difficult to pick one for High Elves because most of their units fit quite well. And uh, as we came to find out while making this, that uh, a lot of the units in the game fit quite well. So this video uh, was difficult to make, but I hope you pleased with our choice. So yes, for the Hiles, Eagle Claw Bolt Thrower. Now moving on to the Lizard Men, we went with the Cold One Riders slash all mounted cav units for a very unique reason. So we have intelligent lizards here that are riding slightly less intelligent lizards that are a little bit smaller than them. And um, what this basically looks like to us at least in the discord was a horse being ridden by a slightly smaller horse or a horse being ridden by a deer or something that is slightly more intelligent than it. It's like, why would you not just have the big lizards, train them up a little bit so that, you know, they can obey orders a little bit better and then send them out on their own. Because if you think about it, putting a big ass lizard on the back of something that is a little bit bigger than itself, is just going to slow that thing down and probably hamper its combat effectiveness if you just sense it in by itself. Now, I know we have feral cold ones, but they're not very well trained. You know, feral is kind of in the name. So if you train these things up, get them domesticated and then send them in, I think they do a pretty good job. Alternatively, you could just send in some lizards that are intelligent and are also quite big and can run in super fast and then get up and do combat when they get there. It just kind of feels like the lizards should have something that isn't them riding another lizard. It'd be kind of like if the Empire had someone where it was like a halfling being piggybacked by a normal Empire man. It, it just wouldn't make much sense. As I said at the start, these units aren't necessarily bad, but they were just very weird to us. So yes, mounted units for the lizard men. Moving on now to the Dark Elves. Now this one was pretty much an instant pick and it was the Doomfire Warlocks and Okay, so the cav units, right? They don't really have a lot of charge bonus or actual damage, so you don't want to leave them in melee, and you don't want them cycle charging too much because, you know, the charge bonus isn't fantastic. Um, but they do, they, they can cast spells. 
why would I not just bring a spellcaster that can cast more spells and then probably get them on a decent mount and then they can do pretty much the same job as the Doomfire Warlocks. And yes, I know they do magical damage, so if you're going against some physical resist, then they are a very good choice. But apart from that, no, they're just quite weird, to be honest. Now, there's nothing that makes them stand out as particularly fantastic or terrible, but they are just so strange. And to be the strangest unit in a faction that literally has Medusas and Hydras and Charybdises that like don't even have eyes, it takes a lot of doing, so you really have to give a round of applause for the Doomfire Warlocks, because they are just so strange, man. As I said, it's not that they're bad, especially when you're going against resistances. It's just that I can't say I would ever use them unless I was just using them to be contrarian. You know, they have spells, but I'd just take a spellcaster. Well, they are cav, well, I'd just take some different cav that's better. Moving on now to the Skaven. Now, this one was easy. It was it's the Warp Grinders. And I know we're thinking Warp Grinders are actually quite good in specific circumstances. And you're right, if you are going against some walls or, you know, you need a, you need a pitch putting up in your house, then definitely call the Skaven Warp Grinders. But if not, and you're not using Nicket Claw, I don't really see a reason to use them. Now, yes, they can have massive arm piercing damage, and yes, their abilities are quite good for pinning down enemy cav. And as I mentioned, yes, they can drill through walls and gates like butter. But apart from that, they don't really have a lot going for them. And when they have the terrible melee stats that they do, I just can't ever see a reason why you'd ever take them in your armies unless it was to do that specific purpose. Say you were doing all sorts of sieges and you were going to take out a lot of walls, maybe have a secondary army full of these guys just to drill your walls following around your main army. Like, the way I looked at it is this. If you were building a Skaven army and you had no idea what you were going against. You didn't know if it was a field battle or if it was a siege battle. You didn't know if it'd be all cav or if it'd be a bunch of flying units or infantry. You don't know anything about the army you're going against or where it is. Would you honestly take warp grinders? Because I definitely know that I wouldn't because they're just not reliable enough to do the job other than that very specific thing that they can do. They're just weird. So yeah, I wouldn't put them in my army and it's my list. So uh, I'm putting them there and the Discord agreed with me as well. So blame them, don't blame me. But first, a brief word from our sponsor. What are you doing, dear? Just looking for some games to play, but they are all so expensive. Plus, I don't know what games my favorite influencers recommend. Have you tried Nexus? What's that? Nexus is a platform where you can see what games your favorite influencers recommend and support them by buying the games you want. Do I have to install a new client just for Nexus games then? No. The stores are all online and provide keys for existing platforms like Steam. I bet all the games are expensive and never on sale. Actually, Nexus price matches Steam, so if a game is on a Steam sale, it'll be the same price on Nexus. On top of that, Nexus also have their own sales every now and then, meaning you get twice the chances to pick up cheap games. And you say this can support the influencers? Yes. Any game you buy from their shop gives them a small share of the profits. You can even see how much this is by clicking on an item. So, is Colonel Damdors on Nexus? Of course. And what games has he got on there? Well, it changes fairly often, but right now he has the whole Warhammer saga, including the first two games and all their DLC, plus a pre-order for Warhammer 3. He also has other games he enjoys and is excited for, like Frostpunk, City Skylines, Vermintide 2, and the Humankind pre-order. Well, those do seem like some pretty cool games. What's the URL? Nexus.gg forward slash Colonel Damders. Nexus.gg forward slash Colonel Damders. I guess I know where I'll be buying all my games from now on. Now for the Vampire Coast. This one was actually rather straightforward when we got to it. It's the Death Street Terrorgeist, because what the frickle frackle does a dragon have to do with being a pirate? Like, it is literally just the Terrorgeist from the Vampire Counts, but somehow, whenever I used it in battle, it was terrible and much worse than the regular Terrorgeist, and then it's been slightly recolored to be green and purple. And then suddenly it's the pirate unit. It's like, well, well, why do they have it? They already have the flying units with the deck droppers. They don't need a large flying unit. You know, they have the necrofex if they want a large unit. It just seems like, like okay, well, we've, uh, we've got the Vampire Coast. And it's kind of missing something. They don't really have a large flying unit like the other guys do. Luva Harkon can ride a zombie dragon. Oh, screw it. Just put the zombie dragons in there anyway. It, it just doesn't make much sense. You know, for a mount for Luva Harkon, 
I can almost get it because, you know, it's a lord. He'd have an extravagant mount. But I can't see them going around randomly taming a bunch of Death Shriek Terror Geists or randomly raising a bunch of Death Shriek Terror Geists when they are pirates. You know, the crabs make sense. The Necrofex Colossus makes sense. The guys that explode, the bloated corpses, they make sense. A purple and green dragon does not make sense. Now we come to the kings of the desert, the tomb kings themselves. And uh, yeah, it's the, it's the carrion. The carrion will forever be on lists of units that are out of place, units that are bad. The carrion, I mean, I know I said it doesn't have anything to do with how good or bad the unit is, but the carrion is just terrible. It has no place in any army whatsoever. It's just such a weird addition that they thought, yeah, th 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 this will be used, you know, it may not be used all the time, but it'll be used every now and then. It, it just isn't, you know, it's a bird, it's, it's a big bird, and not even the epic big bird, it's just a regular big bird. It just looks like a vulture that's been a little bit mummified, its feathers are constantly falling off, it doesn't look like it should be able to fly. It's terrible. Everyone's riffed on this so many times, including myself, up to this point, and I'm just going to leave it right there. It's the carrion, it's weird, just do something with it to make it better, please. Now we come to the Warhammer 1 faction, sign of course, with the Empire of Man. And uh, this one, I get the feeling, is going to be a little bit controversial, but I'm sure once I explain my reasoning, we can all come to an understanding. It's, uh, it's Demogriff Knights. And uh, I'm just going to pause, because yes, I know they're really good, especially the ones with halberds. They were the Empire Doomstack at one point, in fact, but um, they're just weird. It's like, okay, so I know they're really good, but they are slower than horses, so don't charge as well. So why would they not take a horse if they're looking to do some shock cavalry? And you may be thinking, oh, well, they're not shock cavalry. They are standard combat cavalry. Well, you may be thinking, okay, okay, that's fine. That's fine. But why would you go for the Demogriff, which can't fly when literally... Like 10 minutes down the road is Bretonia, who can recruit Hippogriffs, who can fly. Why don't you just go to them and go, Yo, Leon, can you... Where, where do you find those those flying ones? Those ones are cool. You know, we've got these ones that don't fly that live near us, but those ones that fly, now they would be cool. And Leon would just be like, over there. I, I do not care. Just, just go get them. I, I don't care. Just give me trade agreement and we will be okay. He's gone a bit German. Okay, I can't do a French accent, but you know what I'm trying to say here. Why would you not just get the ones that can fly rather than the ones that can't fly? Okay, that's the big thing that gets here. And besides, they are the only monster-ish units in the faction, so they just feel very out of place and strange. It feels like, you know, if we got another DLC and they added some more monster-ish units to the Empire roster, then it'd, it'd fit in a little bit better. But as it sounds right now, they're a bit weird. Now, the dwarves, the Dowie, the short lads. It's the Great Weapons Quarrelers. And uh, I don't really need to explain this one, do I? But I'm going to do it anyway because, you know, we've got to pad out that runtime. So I'll try and be brief. Now, while they are technically better than regular Quarrelers, they have, you know, better weapon stats, they perform better in combat, absolutely. Why would you bother to spend more money on units that are better in melee combat, but they are ranged infantry, and this is on the same faction that has one of the largest melee infantry rosters in the game? Like, well, if, if the enemy is managing to get to your ranged infantry and you have this many melee units at your disposable, disposable? at your disposal, I think there's a problem beyond how good your ranged infantry is at fighting. I think it's something to do with you at that point. That said, if you are terrible to defend your ranged infantry, then for sure, go for the great weapons. They will defend themselves much better. But for your average Joe who can defend his lines, at least somewhat decently, just bring more melee infantry. Why would you bring these guys, save the money, and just get some either better ranged units, like get some thunderers or something that do more range damage, I'll just get these guys and save some money and then stockpile. Now, if you want an early game doom stack of versatile units, then yeah, full army of these guys would probably do just right. Kind of like Lord and Seaguard esque things. Other than that, they're just, they ain't it, Chief. Okay? They ain't it. Now we come to the greenskins. Now, this one was actually pretty hard. You know, we tossed and turned, we went to the trolls because with the recent DLC, the regular trolls just have no place because stone trolls and river trolls are much better than them. But we somehow landed on the squig herd. Now, squigs are completely out of control, as we all know. So when they are in control, they basically just have a goblin strapped to the top of them and then bound into battle and then go on a rampage while being semi under control. So what could possibly possess the tribes of Greenskins to send in these guys without anyone on their backs? Like, I don't think there is a conceivable time when you would send in a squig to battle without a rider and it would do what you tell it to. It would, it would be on a rampage from the second that the battle starts. It might not attack you, but it would not listen to any orders. They are just little balls of anger and teeth and horns and a, you know, a couple of little legs. They are kind of cute. They've got a little tail as well. That's, that's pretty nice. But apart from that, they're out of control, man. So it doesn't make any sense you would send them in by themselves, at least to me and at least to the Discord. And uh, we're really tugging at straws for this one. So um, if, if it's not that detailed, I'm sorry. Now we come to the vampire counts and these ones from this point on are actually going quite quickly because it is pretty clear to see which ones do not belong. 
So the Vampire Counts, as we all know, my personal favourite faction. And uh, is it any surprise that it's the base corpse cat? I'm pretty sure this won the worst unit award as well. And um, pretty much for the same reason that it's winning the weirdest unit award, because it just has no place. It doesn't fit in with the roster. Why would you ever go the base corpse cat when you have other units? You know, like the corpse cat Balefire or the other one that does the other thing, the one that revives people. Why would you ever go the Unholy Load Sensei? I remembered. Why would you ever go for the base corpse cat? It offers the same buff as the other ones, but doesn't include their buffs that they also add. So why would you ever get a base corpse cat? Helm and Ghost, man, stick to the mayonnaise because you do not know shit about building armies. Finally, we're coming to the Warhammer 1 DLC, starting, of course, with Noska. And this one is going to be the base Marauders. Now, there was a lot of debate on this one. Some people said it should be the Famir Warriors because they're technically monsters, but they're also using weapons. So it seems like intelligent monsters won't really side with Noska. And then we decided it could be trolls because why would you get regular trolls if you could get ice trolls when all the Norsk are living his ice? So surely all they'd be able to find is ice trolls. But we came to base Marauders for the pure reason that they are pretty much a copy paste of the unit from the Warriors of Chaos. They have more or less the same stats. They are literally just copy paste. I know it's a meme at this point that Norsk is basically the Warriors of Chaos copied, pasted, thrown in more mechanics and make them a lot better. But this is just ridiculous. They are literally copy pasted units and the pointless copy pasted units. Like why would you ever go base Marauders when like the next building up or the same building, uh, it's been a while since I played Norsko, you have to forgive me, you can get Marauders that have Spears, which are better at fighting monsters, or Marauder Berserkers, which are better at fighting infantry. There's just no time apart from like turn one when you would ever go base Marauders. So why do they exist? They're, they're just kind of a unit that's there to be used for like one turn and then never used again. Even units like Zombies are used beyond turn one because they're useful for chaff. Skaven Slaves are used turn one because they're useful for chaff. But in the Norskan playstyle, in the Norskan roster, there's no place for them. Now, Bretonia, my least favorite faction, some might say, uh, it's going to the Grail re re relic, relic, re relic, the, the guy that is basically a corpse of a, of a Grail Knight being carried around by four peasants. And just why? Okay, it gives leadership and you know what? That's pretty good. Given leadership, in fact, I'm pretty sure if you go back to my Bretonia army guide, I'm pretty sure I had a couple of these in my army because I really like they gave leadership. They could just run around. They looked cool. They didn't require much management. You just send them in there. But you know what else provides leadership? Heroes. And uh, you know what else heroes can do? Actually fight in combat and be useful. Maybe cast some spells, depending on what heroes you get. So why, in the name of God, would I ever go for a Grail Relic? Really, one of these guys, when I could just get hero instead. And I know you may be thinking heroes require capacity and that requires buildings and it's a lot more expensive. Yeah, I get that. But, and believe me, I'm not a hero spam player. I think hero spam is horrifically cheesy. I never run it. I have like one or two heroes in my army at the very most. But I just don't understand why you'd ever get this if you could get a hero. So yeah, don't get these guys. Get heroes because they provide the same leadership buffs, but better and also can fight at the same time. Now the faction that has been most recently updated, which is of course the final elves, the wood elves. Now, this one was pretty much argued for entirely by the Discord, so I'm just going to have to go with what they said here, because, you know, democracy rules and all that. They said the Zotes. Now, when I first saw the Zotes, I agree. I thought that they were a lizard man type unit, and I was like, well, what are they doing? They're, they're clearly lizards. But apparently, when you get into the law, I have been told, this isn't me, I've been told that they actually do fit in with the Wood Elf law. You know, Guardians of the Forest and all that stuff. Very, very cool. But, um, but even in the law... They, they shouldn't be friends with the Wood Elves, they should just be friends with the Tree Spirits. They should kind of be a, um, a Forest Spirit unit, like the ones that Dryka can get with her faction mechanic. It doesn't make any sense that they should be friends with the regular humanoid Wood Elf Lords. So the Lords like Orion and Sister Twilight should not have access to the Zotes. They would hate them, at least as far as I've been told. Again, the Discord's told me this one, so I'm just going over them. If it's wrong, go into the Discord, join that, and give them a talking to. Okay? Cool. But aside from all that, aside from all the law stuff, as I said, we're going to try not to get into this. They, um, they, 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 they were just a bit weird, to be honest. Well, the Wood Elves already have a lot of calves, so, you know, they have a lot of fast units that can get around into the enemy backs. They already have a lot of large units, you know, like the Tree Men and the Tree King that can get into the front lines and do a lot of damage. They already have stuff that can hunt down cavalry just by shooting at them. They have units that are fast, they have units that are strong, they have units that are big. What they didn't really need is a Dragon Ogre reskin, because let's be honest, yeah, they're basically the same unit, okay? Yes, Zotes for the Wood Elves. Uh, I still think they're good, for the record. They are good units, but they're just very strange. Now, the Beastmen. Now, you could argue that um, the units that don't belong to the Beastmen are every single unit because Beastmen are whack. Actually, I tell a lie. The Beastmen roster is not that bad. But one unit that I'm surprised we haven't mentioned yet because it is just so out of place in every single roster 
it's the giant. And uh, I know what you're thinking, giants are useless in every single scenario. And you're correct, actually. Uh, but I don't want to bring them up every time because that gets boring. And as I said, this is not the worst units. This is the weirdest units. But in the Beastmen roster, first of all, it's tiny. So find a unit that doesn't belong. Well, you choose them from about three units in total in the entire roster. Uh, but the giant, it's just it, it just makes zero sense why you'd ever take it. First of all, in the campaign, you need to build a building just for them. Why would you ever do that? It costs you a ton of growth for one unit that you can recruit. And even if you were using it, how many giants would you really take? I know you know you could do an OKI, okay, however you pronounce his name. I apologize and get 19 of them. But are you really going to do that? Or are you just going to get like two? And is it worth it? It's not really. And also, if you're going to get a giant unit that can do a lot of melee combat and lots of melee damage, why not get a Saigon? Because you know what it can do while it's not doing that melee damage or while it's recovering or while it's out of combat? It can throw giant rocks. It is literally just the giant doing the same job and then also doing another job and then also doing the giant's job better. There is no possible conceivable reason why you would ever take a giant. Don't do it. Our final faction, of course, is the Warriors of Chaos. And would you believe giant again? And uh, pretty much the same reason as the Beastmen. Why would you ever go for a giant when you have the Dragon Ogre Shagoth? A similar unit size. It does way more damage. It's way faster. It has a bonus versus large, so it can knock down large targets. There's no reason for it. It's also a smaller hitbox, so it's not going to get shot as much. And I think it has missile resistance. Don't go with the Giants, they're useless people. And with that, we have finally concluded this video. Hopefully it is not too long. I'm looking at about 26 minutes on the whole waveform over here. So I hopefully I'm able to trim that down to a nice compact video for you all to enjoy. Um, if you'd stuck around to this part in the video, thank you very much, love you uh, very, very much. Yes, I do. Be sure to join Discord, as I mentioned at the beginning. Also, while I'm plugging stuff, be sure to check out the Twitch channel. I'll also link that in the description. Uh, I'm doing all sorts of fun stuff over there. I've been streaming some games that have been voted on by a poll every Thursday. And I'm also streaming Warhammer every Sunday. Might be doing some more streams over there soon. Only way to find out, join the Discord or join the Twitch channel. And you'll, uh, you'll be sure to be one of the first people to know. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you did enjoy it, then, you know, definitely be sure to leave a like. It really does help out quite a lot. If you didn't like this video, get screwed with anything that I said. Then be sure to leave a dislike and tell me down in the comments what you think should have been the weirdest unit for every faction in the game. I'm very interested to hear people's thoughts on this one because I think it is a very subjective video to make and uh, you know videos that have opinions and they always uh, they're received so well if you want to see more videos like this more content on top war and strategy games in general let me show subscribe to the channel we're making videos like this every single week yes we are we're making videos every single week now for uh, oh god coming up on two years which is pretty impressive thank you all for sticking for me with this journey over 2021 turns out to be a little bit better than the last one because oh god if it's worse i don't know what we're gonna do lads but yes thank you very much for watching i've been your humble host colonial damnedus and i will see you next turn